Good afternoon. This is Andy Fishburn, ELFA's Vice President for Federal Government Relations. I hope is, everyone is doing as well as can be expected during these unprecedented times. I think it's Wednesday, so welcome to ELFA's second installment of our Wednesday webinars at 1. This webinar, which will cover the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, implications for equipment finance companies. Today, I'm privileged to be joined by two experts in their fields. David Javdan is a managing director with Alvarez and Marcel in Washington, D.C. and New York. As a former legal executive and federal and state financial regulator, he brings seasoned experience and credibility in the corporate and public sectors. Before Alvarez and Marcel, David served as general counsel of the U.S. Small Business Administration, the SBA. So we are really lucky to have David join us today to not only discuss the SBA lending programs that have recently been created, like the Paycheck Protection Program, but also those SBA programs that already existed before this crisis. Our second speaker, Eric Holland, a partner at Reed Smith LLP, has significant experience representing banks, finance companies, and other financial institutions in a variety of secured and unsecured lending transactions. Although a large focus of ex his experience has been in the energy industry, he has worked on transactions in a variety of industries with varying asset classes. Most recently, he has been tasked as the co-lead for Reed Smith to address, analyze, and advise on various matters relating to the CARES Act and the financing programs available under the Act. Eric will be covering the programs that were created by Title IV of the CARES Act. After Eric and David speak, I will present the political outlook for the near, mid, and longer term. You can go to the next slide. Before I turn it over to David, a couple of housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded. Second, there's approximately 400 attendees on, on uh, anticipated to be on this webinar, so you are in, currently in listen-only mode. But we do want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please use the question panel to the right, and we will pause after each speaker presents for a couple questions or two on their sections. And then if time permits, we'll do another round of questions again at the end. Now, without further delay, I will turn it over to David. David? Well, thank you so much, and I appreciate uh, everyone being here today, and I do hope everyone's staying safe. Um, I know that uh, these, are, these are trying times and uh, interesting times for everyone. Um, I, would, I would add on to the housekeeping matters that, uh, although I'm a formal general counsel, you know, A&M is not a law firm, and uh, we are not providing any uh, legal uh, tax or other advice. Uh, many things turn on the specific circumstances. So my goal really here is to to bring to your attention things to be considered. Um, and you uh, you know and obviously uh, you need to work very closely with your your own advisors um, on these things. But we are also always here to help. Uh, if there are any questions or other ways we can be helpful. Um, it has been. Uh, I don't have too many slides. I do have to the extent that anyone needs them afterwards. All sorts of application materials, other things. I joke one of the reasons why I haven't made many slides is because each and every one of them seems to be out of date. You know, if I, if I make them in the morning, they're out of date in the afternoon. Um, there, uh, there have been so many changes here. Um, you know, the PPP program wasn't even in existence a few weeks ago, uh, and it has become uh, obviously a source of a lot of questions and consternations and all that. So let me, uh, let me uh, put things into context. You know, there are two programs I will discuss here briefly uh, that are SBA related, then I will flag a couple others to think about that are not SBA re related, but not really go into them, um, but to really give you a, a broad overview. What's going on right now with the PPP is sort of like building the plane uh, while flying it. There is the uh, EIDL program, the Traditional Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program that uh, SBA has always used. Now that has normally worked well. I've been, uh, I was on the transition for, for this administration. Uh, I've been around for a long time. Most every administration has always come in and said, wait, why are we doing these disaster loans directly through SBA rather than doing them through banks and all that? And the real reason had always been SBA rules are very complicated, very hard. Disasters tend to be in a localized area. Um, although you can guess New Orleans or places that get hit by hurricane. Uh, you know, uh, certain certain parts of Florida may get them a lot. You never know when a disaster is going to happen. So normal disaster programs are designed in mind um, with uh, with 
um, a basic focused geographic locality. And SBA traditionally has been the only direct lender of the United States, um, and it would lend to even uh, non-small business. Uh, so, for example, if your office building was damaged uh, during a hurricane, SBA may lend you the money to rebuild the uh, office building. The economic injury disaster loans uh, traditionally have been a very low, uh, you know, maybe 3%, uh, sometimes even lower, 30-year fix uh, loan directly from the government. The government's much nicer about making modifications um, and all these things. There's normally a, a one-year deferral on payment. Sometimes it comes to, sometimes they might do the, the, the different uh, areas. Um, it is a loan program that requires that you give what collateral there is but we'll still make a loan even when there's not collateral. Um, and it can be used for working capital and all sorts of different uh, types of things. I'm saying a lot of these now to, to, to highlight the difference with PPP. When I talk about things changing with every minute, the uh, idle program was running out of money and people who, uh, I spoke to some people very early on and I said, jump in and please get your money. And some of those folks have even gotten $500,000 worth of, uh, of uh, loans, 30-year fixed loans, and most of the loans that were actually issued, they're honoring. Um, but, uh, you know, as time went by, the program was running out of money, and then they uh, basically became, hey, we'll give you a $10,000 grant, maybe a uh, 15000 loan on top. And then last week, uh, that program ran out of money as well. Now, there is um, uh, $60 billion, uh, hopefully, coming tomorrow. Uh, to refurbish that program. So it's something I would think about. Uh, but again, uh, for a lot of these, it requires personal guarantees, um, um, you know, whatever collateral exists and, and other, other types of things. Now, the PPP was originally designed, again, when we first started talking to people, it was designed to be uh, the modern day equivalent of the SBA disaster loan program, even though SBA had a lot of uh, people uh, who had done this, um, this is the first time in recorded history that the entire United States is a disaster area. Um, and so there just weren't enough people to try and handle um, all the loan applications and everything. So the PPP was really designed to be very similar originally to EIDL. It was designed to be a 10-year, pretty low interest rate, let's say 3, 3.75% fixed um, loan, uh, with a small grant component if you use the proceeds of the loan for certain purposes. Um, as demand became so high and so many people came in, um, the nature of it uh, shifted from being a loan program with a small grant component, basically to a grant program that would convert into a very short term, one year, you know, 1% loan to the extent that um, the proceeds were not used for, uh, for, for the uh, purposes. So, you know, I think people are generally familiar with the program now, but, um, you know, I'll very quickly go over the main parameters and, and maybe leave more for questions. But you can borrow uh, two and a half months worth of payroll. That's the amount that you can borrow. Now, you need to exclude from that uh, people, um, employees of yours that do not work in the United States. So if you have an employee that's a foreign citizen but works in the U.S., you can count them. But similarly, if you have an employee that uh, is a uh, U.S. citizen but is working in Canada, you cannot include her. Um, so, so you need to be careful about that. A very tricky area that's gotten people confused um, is they say salaries are capped at 100000 and they are. That doesn't mean if someone earns $105,000, um, you, you get nothing for them. It's just you can get for them based upon uh, your, um, you know, up, uh, as if they earned 100000 but that is the salary. You can also take it for them. Um, you could also take it for them uh, to you um, benefits, right? So it's the extent, and these are real payroll related benefits that you give paid family leave, uh, that you uh, pay their health insurance, uh, that you pay their um, you know, 401k or other retirement benefits. Uh, and we have more details, but it's very broad. So you may be taking two and a half months of payroll, but on an annualized basis, even though it's capped at 100, the number you could be building off from can be, you know, maybe 118,000, you know. Some rare cases, maybe 120 if the benefits are extremely good. Um, so obviously, you know, folks want to, you know, maximize what they can take coming in. Now, going out, you know, there's two parts, what you get to keep as a loan and what do you, uh, what can you actually 
um, keep, um, you know, for your employees. Um, whatever you pay in payroll, you know, now that is the actual payroll. And I think people are getting very confused with like averages and all that stuff. But what they're going to look at is average payroll um, uh, I mean, for that period. You need to keep people on for that entire eight weeks. When you get the loan, the money's going to hit your bank. Uh, it, it, it's like a hot potato in your pocket. The minute that money hits, um, you're probably going to notice uh, that the money is coming. Um, and then uh, within 10 days, uh, you will get the money. Some folks I've heard have received the money, you know, instantaneously. Others, it's taken longer. Once you have that money, that's your payroll for the, you know, uh, for the next eight weeks, you can get uh, turned into a grant. A um, couple considerations. Uh, you may have laid people off. There may not be time. You may want to retroactively pay some people um, to get your numbers back up. That's perfectly okay. Um, but again, they're going to look not for some sort of odd average or something. They're going to look for the actual dollars that you spent on payroll um, going forward. Um, you know, the, the second thing um, will be what you can get forgiven. Uh, anything that is on payroll within the same limitations that I put forward, that 75% and all that, um, uh, as long as you don't, I'm sorry, as long as you don't diminish the payroll uh, by a certain amount, any amount that you actually pay can get forgiven. 75% um, of the loan, at least, of what is forgivable has to be for payroll. So you can use the loan for other uh, purposes, um, you know, uh, paying your utilities, paying your rent, uh, paying um, the interest on any existing sort of uh, debt obligation or mortgage that pre-existed Right, not paying down the principal, not paying down the debt, but normal course, anything that sort of looks like a mortgage, um, you know, which may be relevant to this world, you can pay that. Um, I know people have been using utilities quite broadly to include, you know, cell phones and all that. Um, you can you you can uh, you can pay that, and to the extent that those amounts are one third or less what you paid on payroll, right? then they're forgivable. I'm saying one third because then you have that one third, the, 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 all of them together, uh, you know, make 100%. So 75% has to be um, on payroll. You can do more on payroll. Um, any amount of money you have left over uh, after that part, and which you might, right, because you're borrowing for, uh, you know, uh, two and a half months, but only paying out for eight weeks. Um, some people have a lot of those other outside expenses, so they'll burn through all the money. Other people won't. Uh, that is a, uh, a loan, a, a one-year loan, um, forgivable. Not for, I'm saying not forgivable. Um, the interest continues to accrue, but uh, you know, doesn't have to be repaid for six months. Um, the forgiveness process is going to come across, um, you know, in uh, in uh, when you're done with the loan period, you're going to have to get the actual documentation of the actual payments that you made, submit that, you'll give it to the bank. Once you've given it to the bank, they will have 60 days to make their determination. A lot of that process has not yet been figured out. Um, and then whatever the delta is, is what you will uh, have to pay back, uh, you know, within the year. Um, as for the idle program, you know, again, very confusing. Um, you know, the, the good news is for the idle, it's, it's much more of a working capital program. You can use the money for a whole lot of other places. Obviously, PPP is, is um, to the extent that you were going to have people on the payroll anyway. Um, you know, it frees up other cash that you can use for other things to the extent that you wouldn't be bringing these folks back, uh, but, but you want to be uh, good to them. You know, something I would take a look at, um, you know, what a number of people are doing is they furloughed their workers and they are um, still paying their benefits and that payment for benefits you can put over there. Um, but, you know, maybe you don't want to have every dollar that's forgivable. We've had a lot of people that have had employees where the employees will actually make more money uh, being on the unenhanced unemployment benefits than they would have if you brought them back. And so if that's the case, you know, maybe it's just not worth it, you know, um, but, you know, that's a calculus you need to do. And if you are doing it, and you want to stay close to your employees and make sure that you're going to be getting them back afterwards, I would make sure that you have the conversation saying, hey, we're doing this uh, this thing with PPP. 
you're someone we would bring back. We look that, you know, you would make more money if we uh, left you where you are. So that's the only reason why we're leaving you where you are, right? That's much more of an HR uh, situation. We know a lot of clients are having those conversations. Idle, we'll see what happens. Um, ironically, I know more about, uh, you know, Idle on the one hand. On the other hand, because the program has been so overtaxed, um, it, is, it is hard to, you know, know what will finally come of it. Um, I generally would encourage people to apply. Uh, you'd have to remember that whatever you use the proceeds from Idle from, it cannot be something that you use in the proceeds for PPP. So you might want to track that very carefully. Um, for uh, amounts above 200,000, it looks like there will be some sort of personal guarantee needed. Um, and the thing to remember is that um, um, the uh, definition of small under PPP is not the same as the definition of small under um, uh, under idle. Um, the definition of small under PPP is 500 or less, or uh, um, it's 500 or less. You have you have to have a tangible net worth of 15 million. You know these are ORs, not AND. 500 or less employees, or tangible net worth of 15 million with uh, not including NOLs, net operating losses, five million or less of revenue uh, in the program, or you have to have an investment from an SBIC, uh, or you have to fit the normal um, uh, size standards, which in some cases may be a thousand or fifteen hundred employees. Whereas for idle, it's only the normal size standards uh, that apply. Um, so something to think about. You know, it's ironic you might be small for one of the programs. Um, but large for the others, um, you know, the, the idle was based on, depending upon the uh, NAICS code, either uh, a revenue or uh, a um, number of employee models. Uh, so those two are there. So, so, so those are the two SBA uh, programs. Now I wanna highlight something a lot of people have been missing um, because they're looking at the CARES Act, but you don't really care and the people that you deal with don't really care if it's under the CARES Act or wherever, if there's a source of liquidity or, or money for them, you wanna do it. A number of existing programs uh, have been modified, but, but not by the CARES Act, but by the agencies. Um, so for example, to the extent that uh, um, it's not already, you've got a pledge on it, uh, you know, I, would, I would encourage a lot of people to look uh, to XM, they've got a working capital program. Um, you know, they have other programs as well, um, not passed uh, under CARES, um, but a, a way where you can borrow against your inventory, um, you know, as it was valued before the, uh, before the crisis happened. Um, and I would just encourage everyone broadly um, that there are a lot of other programs that uh, pre-existed um, you know, the CARES Act and, and, and they're available. So I know that was just uh, a lot. Uh, I'm happy to take a, a question or two if, if that makes sense. Sure, that was great, David. Uh, why don't we do uh, two questions, um, or maybe, maybe two and a half. Uh, one broad question, uh, if you could talk a little bit about how finance companies are treated under the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, under SBA Section 7A. So it it it, it is complicated uh, about what's happening with the program, and and there might be. I understand there were. Uh, this was an area that was a, a lot of consternation, and there might be some new either guidance coming out or under the law that the Senate just passed, and the House is supposed to to to, to pass uh, tomorrow, um, though. None of us have seen it yet. Um, there might be some some clarification there. So normally, if you are actually lending the money and taking it from warehouse, um, because it's, it's a loan program, right? Traditionally, you're looking at, at SBA as a loan program. They don't want you to borrow from the government to to relend to someone else at a more expensive rate, right? They should just be borrowing from the government. Um, uh, so they don't want you to lend to relend. Now, finance companies can usually do it. Uh, if the, the traditional SBA rule has been uh, if you're holding on to this for, uh, if, if you're the lender, but, but you're really using a warehouse line, you're only holding, uh, you're more originating it and you're only holding on to the, uh, to the um, money for 14 days, 
right? So your main thing is to originate, find people, help people, but not really to, to be making from the loans. Um, then, then traditionally you've been in a safe harbor. Uh, and I understand that that is what SBA, at least until recently, has been looking at. Hey, if you're, if you're under 14 days, um, if it's longer than that, then, then the traditional rules have been found uh, to apply. Now, again, a lot of people are saying, wait a second, wait a second. That would make perfect sense if, if this were a loan program, as it originally was. Again, if you read the statute, it's a 10-year you know, fixed loan program, right? You don't want to reloan, but but this part, this is just to give small businesses an incentive not to fire their employees. And why do we care uh, if we're going to fire, you know, we, we want you to keep your employees. Why do we care if you work for something that lends it, you know, for, for 10 days versus, or, or 13 days versus 15 days? So I think that is something to keep an eye on. And then another question, uh, we have a couple about the $100,000 salary limit. So the $100,000 salary limit applies to the amount of the loan. Does it also apply to the amount uh, that can be forgiven? Yes, and I wanna be clear, it is salary. So the number that you will both ask for up front and get forgiven for will almost invariably be more than 100, you know, the, more than $100,000, right? Because there is employ almost everyone has employee benefits, right? And they are also saying you can include taxes. Um, so I would take a look. So I, I know a hundred thousand divided by twelve is you know eight eight three. The number on both sides in almost every case would be higher. Um, and so so do keep uh, do keep an eye on that. And by the way, if you have critical people in your ecosystem that are not employees uh, but independent contractors, you don't count them. Um, for whether or not you're, you're small or not. Um, but please, you know, do encourage them to apply on their own. This is also a change from the way the rules have traditionally been. Uh, the independent contractors um, don't count for this, but they, they are able to apply on their own. Again, they would need to do that math uh, to see whether or not they're better off on, well, actually, if they're an independent contractor, they don't have to worry about the unemployment benefit piece. Um, so, so just something I highlight. And then uh, let's uh, stop the questions for specifically for David there. We might have a time for a couple more at the end, um, but let's transition to uh, the next set of slides with Eric. Next slide, please. All right, turning it over to Eric. Thanks, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Andy mentioned, I'm a partner at Reed Smith and I practice in commercial lending. Uh, after the initial excitement and furor over the SBA PPP program and EIDL uh, loan programs, uh, Title IV is going to become the, the newest source of perhaps consternation and head scratching. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about today is basically just setting up the framework of the, the funding that's going to be available under the title. Uh, as we're still awaiting for further implementing regulations and guidance. <clears throat> so this program is going to provide $500 billion for eligible businesses, and it's going to expand the amount of uh, eligible borrowers that will be able to avail themselves uh, of these loans. So it's not just limited to, to small businesses. If you could move to the next slide, please. So there's the industry-specific program, which applies uh, mostly to the aviation industry, as well as uh, businesses that are considered critical to maintaining national security. Uh, and then there's the mid-sized business program and the Main Street Lending Program. I kind of view them as um, interchangeable because the mid-sized business program is, is still a little bit uh, unclear as to structure and, and formulation, but it's the eligible businesses that would be able to avail themselves under of loans under that program would be uh, companies between 500 and 10,000 employees, whereas the Main Street Lending Program is available to any business, so including small businesses less than 500, uh, but up to 10,000 employees or up to $2.5 billion in uh, 2019 annual revenue. So I'll go quickly through the aviation. It's $46 billion that's available for passenger air carriers, car cargo carriers, and businesses that are critical to maintaining national security. Uh, there are also eligible businesses that can be certified by the Department of Transportation that are related to the aviation industry, and then uh, $25 billion that's otherwise available to passenger air carriers includes ticket agents, et cetera. So 
So in terms of the, the, the general Title IV funding that's available, uh, the, the Fed Reserve is establishing programs that it's either, either purchasing obligations directly from issuers or uh, purchasing obligations in the secondary market. Neither of those are going to be part of this conversation, uh, but rather the third prong, which is making loans. Uh, there's going to be $454 billion available in funding, plus any amounts that weren't used in the industry-specific program. I note that under the industry-specific program, the application deadline was technically uh, last Friday, and so uh, it's still to be seen how much and to what extent uh, those loan funds have been uh, employed. Uh, in terms of the eligible businesses, they, they must be created or organized under U.S. laws and have significant operations in the U.S., and they also must have a majority of employees based in the United States. One thing that is unclear and we're still awaiting guidance on is whether any kind of foreign ownership would render the business ineligible. So far, absent any guidance and just based on the, the, the clear language in front of us, I don't think that foreign uh, ownership would affect eligibility, but uh, we're awaiting uh, further guidance from Treasury on that point. So one of the controversial uh, prongs of this is that uh, most of these loans under the program, including the Main Street Lending Program, include prohibitions on the borrowers making dividends or other capital distributions until a year after the loan has been repaid, uh, including restrictions on buying back equity securities that are listed on a uh, uh, securities exchange. And then there are also certain employee compensation requirements limiting total comp, particularly with respect to high earners uh, within the company. So these are loans that are uh, that are very favorable in terms of interest rate and terms, but there are restrictions that will make them less attractive for certain industries, uh, particularly in the private equity field. So these are considered to have um, a maximum interest rate of, of 2% with automatic payment deferment, so no P&I due for the first six months, which can be extended by the Secretary of Treasury's discretion. Um, and as mentioned, during uh, the period under which the loan is outstanding to some extent a year afterwards, no dividends or buybacks are, are permitted under, under these programs. In addition to uh, applying for the loan, on the certification, uh, much like with the PPP program, the borrower has to make cer certain certifications. And one of those, uh, which is the first, is that uncertain economic conditions created by the coronavirus pandemic makes the loan necessary to support ongoing operations. So these loans are not meant for cash-rich um, uh, companies, uh, but rather people that, that, re that really need the loans in order to uh, continue survival. Um, as I mentioned before, there are certain eligibility criteria uh, based on uh, domestic domicile and where the employees are based. Uh, the borrower must also certify that it's not a debtor in a bankruptcy proceeding and that it will use the loan to retain not less than 90% of its workforce through September 30th, and that it won't outsource their offshore jobs uh, for a two-year period after the repayment of the loan. So again, this is meant to, to try to uh, keep the American workforce employed and incentivize these borrowers uh, to, to make certain concessions uh, in order to keep employment at, at a higher uh, or, or more current level. So the main purpose of this conversation is going to be devoted to the uh, Main Street Loan Facility. Uh, they have two subsets within that, which is the, the new loan facility and then the expanded loan facility. The new loan facility would be a new loan where a borrower currently is going to have an unsecured loan uh, with a new lender. And then the expanded loan facility would be an upsize to an existing term loan under its existing uh, credit agreement. Um, again, this program is available to small and mid-sized U.S. businesses, so from one employee up to 10,000 uh, or 2.5 billion in 2019 annual revenue. And how it works is that there's going to be an SPV that's created and it's going to uh, purchase a 95% participation in these loans that are made by U.S. insured depository institutions, bank holding companies, and U.S. saving and loan holding companies. And then the lender will retain a 5% interest uh, in that. And I'll discuss the, the scope of eligible lenders later as one of the issues that has been raised as, as perhaps uh, too limiting in, in scope. So as mentioned for the new loan facility, it's a four-year term loan. 
uh, amortization of P&I is deferred for a year. Uh, the interest rate is based on SOFR plus a spread of two and a half to four basis point, uh, two and a half to four percent. There's no prepayment penalty. It's unsecured. Uh, it's in a minimum amount of a million, and the maximum is a lesser of 25 million, or an amount uh, or a leverage ratio of four to one. <clears throat> and the calculation of that leverage ratio, particularly with respect to undrawn debt and how EBITDA is determined. It has been a subject of consternation for which certain trade groups, including the Association for Corporate Growth and the LSTA, have both provided comment letters to the Treasury Department, which were due last Thursday. So we expect uh, these uh, nuances to be addressed in, in uh, upcoming regulations and uh, guidance. For the existing um, loan facility, it's an upsize to an existing loan, same terms. Uh, four years, P&I deferred for a year, interest rate of SOFR plus a spread of 25 to 4%. However, these loans are going to be secured, and they're going to be secured by the same collateral that secures the uh, underlying existing loan, and it will be on a, a peri passive basis. This raises also some intercreditor issues, because if you have perhaps uh, an existing term loan where the term lender doesn't want to participate, um, will there be a new lender coming in and, and how does that work? Do you need an intercreditor agreement? Uh, so this is also a, a, a particular point that's subject to further, further guidance. And then the amount, these are going to be slightly larger. Um, it'll be the lesser or minimum of a million dollars to the maximum of the lesser of 150 million, 30% of um, undrawn uh, outstanding committed debt. And then also, I, I see that there's a typo here, so I apologize that, but a leverage ratio of uh, six to one uh, versus the four to one leverage ratio that was required with respect to the new uh, loan facility. So additional criteria that's addressed in the term sheets that have been posted by Treasury are certain fees with respect to servicing, uh, the termination. This program is going to be available up until uh, September 30th of this, of this year. That date may be extended by implementing regulations that have rolled out, but so far that's uh, what's been set forth in the term sheet. There'll be certain participation fees. And as mentioned previously before, with respect to the mid-sized business program, there's going to be certifications that will be made by both eligible lenders and the eligible borrowers. Some of those representation or certifications include that the uh, eligible lender will not use this loan as a means of reducing credit available to or to reduce a line that exists uh, under the agreement with the, the borrower. And also that the borrower is not going to use the funds of these loans to repay higher interest rate, rate debt. There will be certain um, uh, restrictions on payments of, of other loans and that's another uh, issue that has been raised by these two trade associations and their comment letters. Uh, one thing to note is also that they can an eligible borrower can participate in either the new loan facility or the uh, existing loan facility, but not both. And then the uh, other key factor which makes these loans uh, less attractive than the PPP, although they are still cheap sources of financing, is that uh, the, the loans issued under Title IV are not eligible for forgiveness. So they do have to be repaid. Um, and that is one of the, the, the crucial differences between these programs. Now, going back to the eligibility criteria for just a moment with respect to EBITDA, as currently drafted in the term sheet, they don't provide any nuance to what, is, uh, what goes into the calculation of EBITDA. And so both the Association for Corporate Growth and the LSTA have suggested that you should use some sort of adjusted EBITDA calculation. So for example, in an existing loan facility where you're doing an upsize to the tranche, it makes more sense to use the same definition of EBITDA that's calculated under the existing loan documents. And then for the new loan facility, you know, you're dealing with uh, a sophisticated lender and borrower that can negotiate appropriate addbacks to make uh, the leverage ratio uh, work because a lot of companies are gonna be kicked out by the eligible criteria based on leverage uh, if, you, if you just use straight up EBITDA. In addition, um, going into the calculation of leverages, what does it mean to, to add committed but undrawn debt? Um, undrawn debt typically should not be included in the, the calculation of leverage. So um, they have suggested that Treasury modify that requirement 
so that uh, only drawn debt counts towards uh, leverage. Then also with respect to the lenders, currently, you know, these are only U.S. banks that are uh, allowed to participate. And I think uh, the, the spirit of the LSTA and the Association for Corporate Growth is to promote the ability of both direct lenders, uh, also non-bank lenders, such as finance companies, and also U.S. branches of foreign banks to be able to participate as eligible lenders under the program. Uh, you know, if the, the impetus is to stimulate American businesses, uh, I think that the focus really should be on the eligible borrowers versus the, the eligible lenders. And so expanding the, the universe of lenders that are available to make these loans, I think, would be a good thing. Uh, one of the other points would be with respect to distributions and the prohibition on distributions. A lot of credit agreements, and just as a practical standpoint under their operating agreements of the companies, is that they're required to make certain tax distributions. As currently drafted, those would not be permitted. And so we think that there needs to be some further guidance uh, to, to determine whether those tax distributions would be able to be made. And uh, uh, lastly, just from the interest rate, I, I noted that the, both of the, the new loan and the existing loan facilities are based on a SOFR rate, so the secured overnight financing rate. But uh, what if the underlying credit agreement, and this is relevant with respect to the expanded loan facility, if that facility is based on LIBOR, you know, how does that work to have the different pricing and will that complicate documentation? So as I mentioned, you know, what we have right now is the general structure of the Title IV programs, particularly with respect to the Main Street Lending Program. And as implementation, implementations of the, the guidelines and regulations roll out, we're going to have more information. But I uh, just wanted to give you guys an update because especially if they expand the universe of lenders to include finance companies, it may be an opportunity for, for you to participate in these types of programs. So with that, I'll turn it back to Andy, and thank you for your time. Eric, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, when do you think that the Federal Reserve will actually start, uh, and banks, I guess, will really start making loans under the Main, uh, Main Street Lending Program? That's a great question, and I think that there's still some uncertainty around that. As we saw with the PPP program, the rollout was swift and to be honest a little bit clumsy um there there were kind of guidelines that were being issued on top of faqs and there was a lot of confusion particularly with respect to affiliation rules uh and so i think that they're trying to get this one right this one's a lot more complicated than the ppp most of the ppp loans uh you basically got a form loan agreement and note and they were non-negotiable Whereas these are going to be documents that are being negotiated by sophisticated parties that will have outside legal counsel. And so it's not just an online application. If we receive um, implementing regulations, I would expect within, you know, three to four weeks, probably that these loans will start actually becoming um, documented. And then do you ever see a day where the Main Street expanded loan facility would be broadened to include uh, revolving loan facilities? That's an interesting, interesting question as well. Um, that was also something that was brought up in the LSTA comment letter that was published um, last Thursday. And, you know, a lot of borrowers might get kicked out of the existing um, loan facility because they only have a revolver. And so if the idea is to just expand their facility or upsize it, you know, what's the harm of having uh, an upsized re revolving commitment um, versus a term loan. And I suppose it goes to just the, the drawdown feature or the, the, it being secured, but um, we'll see uh, if there is any flexibility on that. But there is appetite, I think, in the market, particularly on the lender side, for this to be applicable to, to both term and revolvers. All right. Uh, great. Well, I am going to uh, go over uh, the next section of the presentation, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. Um, so all, on all these items, ELFA has been actively involved in advocacy since back in uh, March, even in mid-March. Uh, we were getting involved in things like our commercial finance companies clearly delineated as being essential. Uh, we wrote letters in March to the Small Business Administration asking them to please make sure that finance companies would be eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program loans. 
Uh, and again, in after the interim final guidance came out, we asked them to reconsider making finance companies eligible under the Paycheck Protection Program. And unfortunately, we have not been successful yet. And with the current political environment where large restaurant chains are getting criticized for having received loans, even though a, a very high portion of their workers are hourly servers and chefs and, and uh, dishwashers, um, if that's the political environment that we are operating in, uh, optimism for getting finance companies included into the program is definitely starting to wane as the program uh, uh, ages into, uh, I know it sounds very young, but uh, as the program uh, goes on for a couple of weeks. We have also been active, uh, as Eric was mentioning, with the Federal Reserve on the Main Street Lending Program, trying to push them to uh, utilize a, a debt to EBITDA standard that would allow for equipment finance companies who by their nature are leveraged to uh, be eligible to get uh, to get uh, loans out of that facility as well. So uh, we are uh, a little bit more optimistic on the Federal Reserve side. The Federal Reserve definitely has a strong understanding of financial markets and how financing is accomplished in the United States. So we're, we're a little bit more optimistic on that side. But there was uh, a few other things in the CARES Act, if we could go to the next slide, having to do with taxes, which are impactful, really in, more in the midterm than the short term, uh, but some of these could be, could be pretty impactful as well. Uh, the biggest one that we've heard about is the change to the NOL carryback positions. Uh, during tax reform, the ability to carry back net operating losses was reduced. And as part of the CARES Act, uh, the provisions for 18, uh, 18, 19, and I think it's 20, um, uh, have been changed such that uh, you can carry those back for five years now. Importantly, that means that you can actually carry back losses to a time period where there was a 35% tax rate, which means that the revenues are getting taxed at 21%, but the losses are getting uh, uh, getting uh, deducted at a 35% rate. So that could be pretty impactful if, if you have the ability to uh, file an amended return. Of course, uh, just for the record, uh, it's important to note that the IRS is uh, apparently overwhelmed with uh, returns right now, uh, and they have a lot of facilities that are closed as well. So tax returns are not being processed as quickly as they would be, especially if they're in paper form. Also, the ability to deduct business interest deductions which was limited as part of tax return to 30% of tax EBITDA. Uh, that has been changed to 50% of tax EBITDA for this year. And I could see that being extended into 2021 uh, should, should the economic uh, situation continue to be uh, a dire one. There was also a whole host of payroll tax provisions having to do with delaying of, of payment of payroll taxes and also filing extensions. And then of course, uh, there was the efforts to get direct deposits out and uh, checks to every American uh, uh, within certain salary limitations, uh, maxing out at around a, a little under $200,000 for, for a married couple. So those were the tax provisions. If we can go to the next slide. So what's next? Um, this is the famous pictures from the State of the Union on February 4th of this year, so less than three months ago. And it's important to remember that this was the state of the of bipartisanship in the US Congress when uh, the first deaths were just around the corner. Uh, during the State of the Union, the president dedicated one paragraph to, to the pandemic, and that was really all that uh, folks were focused on. It wasn't a big issue in February, but the state of affairs between the Democrats and Republicans in Washington has been was was really bad in February and has not gotten a lot worse. There's been no rallying to the flag amongst the uh, the partisanship here in Washington. Going to the next slide. So what's next is we faced a whole host of pressures on the economic side. You have state budgets being hit by a lack of gas taxes, lack of, uh, lack of sales taxes. 
see hospitals losing their revenue because there are no elective procedures anymore. You see unemployment claims, and it looks like a very uninteresting chart until you realize the huge upward spike at the end that almost looks like an axis line. And then, of course, all the small businesses that are closed as well. Not only are all small businesses closed, for any of you who have been talking to your friends and family around the country, there is also a great reluctance to go back out even when uh, businesses reopen. So even a, once businesses begin to reopen, it is going to be a very slow reopening process. We go to the next slide. Uh, so this is uh, on the graph on the left, of course, the famous flattening of the curve. And uh, not only am I a Michigan alumni, so I like to choose things from the University of Michigan, but this is also the picture on the right is the protests outside the uh, Capitol in Lansing, Michigan. So what you're going to see is a dynamic between the health officials pushing to uh, maintain the stay at home orders, maintain social distancing, and then a push from uh, segments of the population who want to get back out for whatever reason, but then also a real push from economists and business owners that are truly suffering under the uh, closure requirements uh, to start to reopen the economy so that uh, this doesn't turn into a situation where the, the economic suffering is actually outweighing the health, the health suffering. And that is gonna be a really, really difficult balancing act for politicians across the country. And it is gonna be one that will, uh, will cause various politicians around the country to rise and fall based upon their decisions upon it. So that's kind of what the near term lies. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, yesterday the Senate passed an expansion of the Paycheck Protection Program uh, to add a little over $300 billion, $60 billion of that is reserved for community banks and 250 uh, going into the, the rest of the program. That will provide a lifeline for that Paycheck Protection Program loan, but current estimates only have that lasting for a couple of days. So there will be additional legislation here in the near term, but what that legislation is going to look like is, is, very, is, is still very undetermined. If I could go to the next slide. One of the things that's being discussed is uh, increased in infrastructure spending. But remember that infrastructure spending is going to be done by a Congress that is extremely split and has not been able to get over the line for infrastructure in recent years. And uh, so this is the slide for infrastructure week in 2020. If I could go to the next slide. You would be forgiven from thinking that you've seen that slide before because you saw it in 2019. And on the next slide, you saw it in 2018. In the next slide, and it has become even a meme of every week is infrastructure week here in Washington, D.C. So infrastructure is one of those things that's really hard. It involves tax increases, involves huge spending. Uh, it involves making decisions on what to spend on uh, and what to tax. And those are things that the American body politic right now is not mature enough to be able to handle. Um, so it will, it will take some uh, dramatic changes to get any sort of large infrastructure bill across the, across the finish line. Not saying it's impossible, but it's definitely hard. Next slide, please. What we could see happening is some sort of effort at the federal level to address some of the issues that have occurred across the country, and people are now really aware of the impact of the closures, ranging from DMV closures to not being able to meet with an actual notary, to the courts closing, uh, and not being able to file for whether it be uh, bankruptcy or some sort of filing having to do with, with a deal. Um, if the courts are closed, it's been very, very difficult to make any sort of filings at both the federal and the state level. Also, next slide. Next slide, please. One of the issues where I definitely see some uh, developments uh, coming in the near, in the, in the mid to longer term is some sort of development for a pandemic insurance uh, program. This was actually the cover of a uh, program that uh, came out in 2016 out of the Gates Foundation, uh, looking at the issues of pandemic risk. 
And this has also been something that's been in the news lately with some of the restaurants that have been closed carrying insurance, uh, but not getting the pandemic uh, rider on their insurance, but saying that the, the their losses should still be covered. And this is gonna be something that's very similar to the terrorism risk insurance program, where it, it's going to be slow to develop, but it's definitely something that I, I think uh, we will definitely see over the next coming months, a lot of discussion about developments of pandemic insurance products. And then on to the, the political side, if we go to the next slide, uh, we are going to see a lot of discussions about absentee ballots and mail-in voting. Uh, the picture on the right is the pictures from Wisconsin during their primary of people having to line up around the block uh, due to uh, election set, uh, polling stations being closed uh, across Milwaukee and having to line up six feet apart, making the lines, of course, appear to be much longer than they would normally. Um, but this is going to be what we face in November. Uh, we're going to be facing uh, 50 different state rules for the elections. Different states are going to go all mail-in. Uh, some states are going to go to um, uh, no no fault absentee ballots. Uh, some states will go to COVID-19 absentee, absentee ballots, which means you just have to check the box saying that uh, you don't feel comfortable voting uh, due to the ongoing pandemic. So that will be something that uh, uh, people are going to face when they're actually voting. And then going to the next slide, this election cycle is also going to look like no other election cycle. You're not going to see packed convention centers in all likelihood with balloons dropping from the ceiling. What you're more likely to see is empty convention centers or empty stages or empty rooms with politicians at the front of it speaking, but maintaining that socially distance with only really camera crews there. And then of course you could see, you will see a lot of things like the picture of Joe Biden broadcasting to, uh, to uh, from his basement as well. And so this election cycle is gonna be one that we have not seen before. Of course, we have gone through elections uh, during times of national crisis in the Civil War and in World War I. Um, and we will get through this, but what the election season is going to look like is unknown. And it's definitely gonna be one that we haven't seen before. So now we have uh, some time to take on up a couple more questions. Um, I think the, the first one will uh, go back to uh, David. Uh, on the EIDL uh, program, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, a lot have been made about the affiliation rules, limiting companies that can apply for Paycheck Protection Program loans. Do the affiliation rules also apply to EIDL loans? They do. They do. Uh, they are somewhat different affiliation rules. Um, you know, it's complicated. Uh, they they went back to the old affiliation rules uh, for PPP, but also loosened them. Um, so, for example, with PPP, you know, you could have someone that owns 48 percent of you. But if they don't exercise certain blocking rights and this and that, you could still uh, qualify as independent. Um, there is going to be a presumption of control under EIDL um, if uh, it is a rebuttable presumption, um, you know, pretty much kicks in after 30 percent. All right. Uh, question for Eric. Uh, what is the probability that an eligible lender for the Main Street Lane uh, that non-bank finance companies will be, will be able to be lenders under the Main Street Lending Program? Currently, they are not, um, but the, the hope would be that they, they would be eligible based on the feedback from the Association for Corporate Growth and the LSTA, as well as any other um, comments that have been sent in to Treasury. We just don't know the answer to that yet, but the hope is that finance companies should be and would be allowed to participate. Then uh, another question for David, uh, what is the process for independent contractors to uh, be able to apply for Paycheck Protection Program loans? Yep. So the process is go to your bank um, and see if your bank is, uh, is um, participating in the Paycheck Protection Program. That is the best way to do it because then um, they have the, un the normal anti-money laundering 
and um, and uh, Bank Secrecy Act issues, know your customer issues. So it is best if you have an existing relationship with your bank. And a lot of your banks, if you have an existing relationship, you could even apply online. If you've got a primary contact at the bank, you know, give them a call to find out. You know, Bank of America is a huge lender. Uh, JP Morgan Chase has been a huge lender. Uh, Wells was, but they've run into a limit, um, um, a regulatory limit as to how much they're allowed to lend that has not yet been lifted by the government. Um, so you can go and the form, you know, I have a copy of the form and everything like that. Uh, most banks are making you just apply right online. It's pretty straightforward. You might have to upload some attachments. Um, but if you have an existing relationship with a bank, um, you know, that is the, the, the best way to go. If you don't, on the SBA, you can go to the SBA website and there is a, um, uh, a link that will tell you. But the, but the process for an independent contractor uh, is exactly the same as the process, um, you know, for, for any other business. What might be a bit more complicated is, you know, you have to calculate, you know, when you're calculating forgiveness and all that stuff, you know, they're probably going to look at, um, you know, uh, you know, you don't have a payroll. The money that you have is sort of um, un unusual for the income. You can average it over the last year. You can use some other sort of, you know, basis to do it because, you know, a lot of the times the IC's income are not uh, regular. If you're, if they're, if you do something more seasonal, uh, you can you can define a season and go look to that income you know um, you know for for that as well um, the the you know more tricky issues tend to be um, you know how do you document you know what you made if you have regular you know w nine forms and all that stuff that's great you know people who do uh, you know on, on one extreme you know like Lyft and Uber it's a, it's a bit more complicated documenting them. Um, but it, it's the same process and same attachments, um, but uh, sometimes trying to document the things being asked are a little more complicated. Yeah, um, we got a question. We got a couple questions about the uh, the rough rollout of the Paycheck Protection Program loan, and internally we had a little bit of a, a, a race between whether the program would run out of money or not before the actual interim final rules were actually published in the Federal Register, and it was close. They did run out of money um, the day, the morning after uh, the rules were actually published in the Federal Register, which meant that almost all the money was gone before the rules were actually even formally published. And we've seen a lot of criticism about uh, different companies getting large loans of course, when you do the math for, for example, you know the Ruth Chris example of they have 5,000 uh, hourly employees, they got $20 million. That means they got $4,000 for each of their hourly employees. It's once you do the math, it's not all that surprising that they would get that they would get funding uh, to be able to support their payrolls as well. Um, what David, do you have any kind of reaction to the the uh, criticisms of the Paycheck Protection Program and the fact that uh, there are still businesses that need money that have not been able to get it? Well, I think the extra money is coming. It is very hard for me to be critical of anyone with the PPP. I mean, you, they basically built the, um, built the plane, you know, uh, while flying it. You know, the program didn't exist before. There was a reason to make it before. A lot of the banks, you know, they were working good faith. They weren't allowed to take other people on. I mean, plenty of bad things. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think it's very, I think a lot of the criticisms, you know, the whole Ruth Chris thing. I mean, the, the, the what Ruth Chris did was an FAQ. An FAQ said you could do it, right? So it was printed in the guidelines saying you could do it. And you're talking about, you know, franchises. Um, you're talking about other people. Um, again, you know, you're trying to keep uh, businesses and other things operating in a, in a very hard hit industry. And, and you can say restaurants are very hard hit. There's no seating. Hey, airlines got everyone covered, right? Um, so I understand a lot of the criticisms. Um, you know, maybe some things have to change and all that stuff. But I think most, some of the people getting beaten up the most, you know, they did something they were explicitly told they could do and should do to try and keep people employed. 
uh, and the poor folks at the SBA. I mean, the program kept changing on them. Um, so I think there's a lot of bad things that happened. Um, uh, but I but I do think a lot of it was coming from people just trying to do the best they can in a tough situation. Great. Uh, thank you. I uh, agree with all of that. And I'd like to if we could go to the wrap uh, the wrap up slide. Um, the um, one thing I would say to all the participants is if you are unhappy with the policy outcomes that we've had here, uh, ELFA stands ready to help you engage with your members of Congress. Uh, to try to change those policy outcomes uh, only by raising the volume on those complaints will be will we be able to get the policy outcomes changed and we stand ready to help you do that um, this web seminar has been recorded and will be available on our website we also ask you to complete the post event survey it will be short out sent out shortly and of course we have the ELFA's federal government uh, COVID-19 re uh, response resource page, uh, which is on the ELFA website uh, where all of these materials have been posted uh, since uh, the middle of March, we began that page and uh, we will continue to uh, post things there as events uh, develop in addition to utilizing all of the ELFA communication channels to make sure the membership is up to date as to what is going on. So. Uh, thank you to David and Eric uh, for a great presentation, and thank you to all the participants, and uh, hope everyone uh, stays safe and well and uh, has a good rest of your Wednesday. Again, uh, this is a series. We have a couple more webinars coming up, uh, so look for those on the LFA website. We have one on cybersecurity, I believe, is next, and uh, that should be a great one. So thank you all, and uh, have a good rest of your day.